All right, in this video, we want to discuss the microbiology related to the human respiratory tract. <clears throat> so the respiratory tract is critically important in terms of our interaction with microbes because this is probably the most common place that a human is exposed to pathogenic microorganisms. We know that's a big deal right now as we talk so much about transmitting the coronavirus via respiratory droplets. So let's think about the anatomy of the respiratory tract, and then we'll think about the defenses that our body has built in there to try to keep microbes from infecting us. And then we'll think about the common microorganisms we find living in the respiratory tract. So first, let's begin with the anatomy. The respiratory tract will generally break into two, uh, two components, the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. So the upper respiratory tract, think of everything in the neck and above. The upper respiratory tract would include major structures like the nose, the mouth, the sinuses, nasopharynx, pharynx, and our trachea. All right? There's lots of other ancillary little structures, but for our class, we just need to know sort of the gross anatomy. So the upper respiratory tract will be sort of the neck and up, uh, the lower, or sorry, the upper respiratory tract will also include the ear. So it's important to recognize that the ear is connected to the nasopharynx through this eustachian tube, thus connecting the ear structure to our respiratory tract. And so infections of the ear are considered infections of the respiratory tract. And we'll consider those as we move forward. All right, so everything from the neck up is uh, the upper respiratory tract. From the neck down, we'll consider the lower respiratory tract. So here, the structures are really just the lungs, right? So the trachea connects the upper and lower respiratory tract. The trachea feeds into the lungs. There are specific structures within the lungs, like the bronchi, the bronchi, the bronchioles, and the alveoli, right? So these are just the smaller and smaller compartments within the lung structure. And we need these very small compartments so that we can transfer gases between the blood supply and the air, the air that we're breathing in and out of the lungs. All right, so those are the major structures of the respiratory tract. What uh, mechanisms do they have built in that protect those structures from infection? All right, so what are the defenses of the respiratory tract? We'll start at the top. We'll start at the upper respiratory tract when we're breathing in. One of the very first defenses of the respiratory system are simply like our nasal hairs. These nasal hairs act as filtration, keeping particulates out of the respiratory tract in hopes of keeping microbes out of the respiratory tract. Uh, if we go a little bit deeper into the respiratory tract, we can look at cells and we see that our respiratory tract is really rich in cells that are ciliated or they have cilia. And we'll think about why we have so many ciliated cells in the respiratory tract in just a second. But before we can talk about what they do, we need to know that they work in conjunction with mucus. So our respiratory tract cells produce lots of sticky mucus, which coats all of the cells lining the respiratory tract. So what are, how do these two structures work together, the cilia and the mucus? So let's look at this picture here. So here is the, uh, ep the epithelial cells of our respiratory tract. Again, they're rich in these ciliated cells. So that all these cells have little uh, cilia extensions, which can move back and forth. And there's some other cells like these goblet cells. They're important for helping to produce the mucus secretions. And so here's the lumen of the trachea, the inside of the trachea. So this is the inside of the respiratory tract. And again, it's lined with these ciliated cells and they're covered with mucus. So this light section here might be the mucus that we're considering. So we need these two together because these cilia are going to beat back and forth, sort of side to side. And as these cilia beat back and forth, they're actually going to create a flow in the mucus that is sitting on top of them. And that flow is up and out of the respiratory tract. So any potential pathogen that I breathe in 
should get stuck in this sticky mucus. And then my ciliated cells are going to beat back and forth and create a flow in that mucus, bringing those pathogens up and out of my respiratory tract. So ciliated cells and the mucus production work hand in hand to protect us from pathogens. And this process is called the mucociliary escalator effect. Again, the beating of the cilia causes a flow of the mucus up and out of the respiratory tract. That mucus will carry potential pathogens with it. So that's a really important component of the defenses of the respiratory tract. But there's others. So we will also have some involuntary responses that help defend us from uh, pathogens. So these involuntary processes are things we can't quite control but happen every once in a while. Things like coughing, sneezing, and swallowing. All right, so why do we perform these processes? So for coughing and sneezing, here our respiratory tract gets stimulated in a way to use air to try to expel additional particulates from our respiratory tract. So if we breathe in a bunch of something and it irritates the respiratory tract, our body sort of recognizes that we've inhaled something and potentially pathogens could be on those particles. So we might sneeze or cough to drive a large volume of air out of our lungs quickly, expelling those particles with it. Um, during disease, we might have sneezing or coughing because that mucociliary escalator effect is inhibited and that mucus isn't flowing up and out. And so our body can use sneezing and coughing to drive out mucus. The next involuntary response is swallowing. Here, um, our respiratory tract is attached to our mouth. If we uh, drive mucus up and out, it might end up in our mouth. Mucus can drip down from the sinuses into our mouth. Any pathogen stuck in that mucus, if we swallow it, ends up in our stomach acid and is likely going to be killed. So that protects us from pathogens as well. All right, the defenses don't end there. As we said, as I said earlier, the respiratory tract is by far the most common place that the human body is exposed to pathogens. So with that in mind, our body populates the respiratory tract with immune cells. So our respiratory tract is really rich in macrophages, right? Uh, phagocytic cells, they're gonna help protect us against foreign substances and pathogens that might show up. So we keep lots of macrophages in the respiratory tract. We also keep, uh, we have cells that secrete a lot of antibodies. So we again know that this is one of the most likely places for a pathogen to show up. So it's one of the most likely places we might be re-exposed to a pathogen we've seen in the past. So we'll keep B cells producing antibodies in the respiratory tract so that those antibodies interact with any potential pathogen that shows up as fast as possible. And we really activate that immune response to remove it right away. So our immune or our defenses in the respiratory tract are really robust. Again, this is because the respiratory tract is the most common place that we are exposed to pathogens. There are also normal microbes living in our respiratory tract all the time. And so as always, we want to think about the conditions these microbes are experiencing, what kinds of microbes we find there and their role in disease. So in general, um, because of the defenses, the normal biota of the respiratory tract is limited to the upper respiratory tract. The lungs should be sterile. The presence of microbes in the lungs is by definition an infection. So we do find tons of microbes in the upper respiratory tract. Um, Generally, those uh, organisms are gram-positive bacteria. They're quite common. Uh, the kinds of organisms that live in the upper respiratory tract can be disease-causing. Right? So all, many of us harbor 
microbes in our upper respiratory tract that can cause disease, but they're usually not causing disease. That is because these microbes are either opportunistic pathogens or some of us are asymptomatic carriers of potential pathogens. So again, opportunistic pathogens just means that if this microbe ended up in a slightly different part of my respiratory tract or on a different part of my body, it could cause disease. Or an opportunistic pathogen means that if my defenses are uh, lowered, then the, this microbe could begin to cause disease. Again, asymptomatic carriers are people that harbor a disease-causing microbe, and it's, they're no, showing no signs or symptoms but they could pass that uh, microbe to someone else and that person could become ill. So a great example of an asymptomatic carrier are um, people and strep throat. So I, for one, have never had a case of strep throat in my life. I absolutely doubt that this is because I was never exposed to the strep causing microbe, but rather I think that I am just an asymptomatic carrier of that microbe. And if I passed it to someone else, they could become infected with that particular microorganism. All right, so examples of these kinds of microbes that we'll find commonly in the upper respiratory tract but can cause disease, Streptococcus pyogenes, Haemophilus influenzae, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Neisseria meningitis, Staphylococcus aureus, Again, all of these can cause disease. All of these are very common in the respiratory tract. The last uh, thing we'll point out about the respiratory tract is that these microbes that are living there, they're actually part of our defenses as well. So whenever we have microbes inhabiting parts of our body while we're in normal health, those microbes are taking up space that pathogenic microbes find harder to take over. Right? These microbes that live in our uh, respiratory tract are going to defend their territory. And if a pathogenic microbe shows up and tries to live in that area, these microbes are going to compete with that pathogen for space. And again, we call that microbial antagonism, and it's a really important component of our defenses against pathogens. So we'll end there. Uh, again, I don't. my goal is not for you to memorize names of microbes that can be found in different organ systems. But as we discuss diseases in our course this semester, think about if any of these endogenous microorganisms are causing any of the diseases you learn about. And if you find an endogenous microorganism is causing a disease, that's an important detail to remember about that disease, that it is caused by an endogenous microorganism and, it, and thus is an opportunistic infection. Anyway, we'll end there. Uh, as always, let me know if you have any questions and I look forward to talking to you all again very soon.